Warning! This episode is going full speed ahead into spoiler territory for the Magnus Archives. I'm talking about spoiling basically everything in the show here, so if you have any intention of listening to it, which you should if you haven't already, bookmark this page and book it out of here so you can enjoy the series in its true glory. Also, this episode is going to feature in-depth discussions of fear, in particular as they relate to being hunted, followed, and chased with a sprinkling of wild animals. As a result, viewer discretion is advised. Oh, and a massive thank you to the Magnus Archives wiki, which was very useful in getting the info for this video together. Hey y'all, I'm Afton G. Kier, and today we're talking about the spot. What the hell? That's not supposed to happen. Hold on, I, I can fix this. I just need to go get some help. I'll be right back, okay? Hey y'all, I'm Afton G. here, and today we're talking about The Hunt. The Magnus Archives is a great podcast, and within that world there are 15 dread powers, which act as the manifestations of human fear. As far as I'm concerned, it's one of the best organizations of fear found in any horror media, so I wanted to start this series focused on breaking down each of them. This episode puts us a third of the way through this examination, so if you want to watch the previous four videos, feel free to click on the i-card in the top right of your screen. Anyways, the hunt is on, so let's pursue this topic. Alright, I, uh, I don't know if you can hear me, but I think I got this hunk of junk working. Of course, while I'm calling for help, I might as well remind all of you that liking and subscribing are totally free, very simple, and only take a second of your time. If you want to be notified when I make the rest of this series, Tap the bell and select all uploads. Alright, now, how the hell do I get out of here? The Hunt, also known as the Ever Chase, is the fear of being hunted, stalked, or chased. Interestingly, this is described by Jared Key as one of the two fears primarily given form by animals rather than humans, accounting for why it's so primordial, as well as why its effects on the human form are so strange. Humans rarely fear the hunt in most normal situations, given how effectively we've managed to cut ourselves out of the food chain, but it does still weave into the human psyche through obsessions, especially those such as finding, tracking, and hunting. The hunt's manifestations, much like its source wells of fear, lean towards the animalistic, with a particular turn towards canines. Honestly, the hunt is a pretty simple fear, but the role it plays within the world of TMA is essential to the metaplot. The hunt doesn't actually have many characters, which is probably a good thing given how powerful they can be. You see, hunters, as they're called, are a subset of avatars which are addicted to the chase and seem to be some of the only beings capable of destroying a fully realized avatar. This makes them a hot commodity among the powers, often working under another or simply as a rogue agent, guided by their blood. The main hunter we see throughout the series is Alice Daisy Tonner, a former detective turned begrudging institute aide in season 3 of the show. Daisy gets her unique nickname from a starburst-like scar on her back that she received from an attack by Calvin Benchley, who served as Daisy's first encounter with the hunt. She later found and shot him five times, but first she joined up with the police, and after getting Section 31 into an investigation by Brecon and Hope, was the designated monster killer of the Force. Speaking of which, this is probably a good place to explain Section 31, which refers to Section 31 of the Freedom of Information Act, a piece of legislation which seeks to avoid prejudicing law enforcement in an investigation. In the world of the Magnus Archives, this has been extrapolated to include anything potentially supernatural, and a small subset of sectioned cops who have already had to sign a form are usually the ones selected to handle such events. Essentially, it's evil magical bureaucracy, which we'll probably see more of in the upcoming Magnus Protocol. Anyways, yes, Daisy is one such officer who generally cleans up after particularly messy investigations, if you're picking up what she's putting down. In the aftermath of Prentice's attack, Daisy and her partner Basira got called in to handle things. I can't really talk about Daisy without Basira, so let's take a quick detour to discuss her. 
Basira Hussein, while never a fully realized hunter, was certainly on that path, and she was Daisy's sectioned partner until she got held hostage by more evil magical bureaucracy in the Magnus Institute, and became a full-time employee. There's a whole bunch of stuff that happened before that, like Daisy almost killing our protagonist, but these are meant to be quick summaries and honestly, I want y'all to go ahead and just listen to the series, so I'm gonna gloss over most of it. Anyways, Daisy gets stuck in the buried, gets freed, goes beast mode, the world ends, and she gets shot by Basira. Not a bad time on that summary at all, I think. Next up in the rogues gallery of hunters is Trevor Herbert, a self-proclaimed monster hunter and professional homeless person who started out tracking down vampires, trust me we'll get to those later, before eventually moving on to more powerful prey. As he moved on, he joined forces with Julia Montauk, daughter of renowned serial killer Robert Montauk, who holds a bit of a grudge against the dark, and began traveling all over. That covers most of the hunters, but I do have to give an honorable mention to that one werewolf guy in America who tore open a hunter, the regular kind, not the magic kind, a crusading hunter of the reform who killed a former Hilltop Road resident, the crazed murder club friends who brutally murdered each other, and the admiral. I know he's a cat, give me this, he's too powerful not to include. Alright, with all that out of the way, let's move on to our... What? Oh. Oh no. Alright. Let's talk about the vampires. I genuinely have no idea who they're meant to serve. And if y'all can show enough support in the comments, I actually might break down each contender and explain my reasoning in an entirely different video. But for right now, all you need to know is that TMA vampires are basically super flammable feeding tubes wrapped in skin and teeth that tear into your neck and then leech out all of your blood. Not a pleasant way to go at all, yet still preferable to figuring out what power they belong to. The hunt has very, very few artifacts, and in fact, there's an argument to be made that there are no proper hunt artifacts at all. But I have a video to produce, and I'm not letting something like a lack of information stop me. The Stalwart Hunter's Almanac was a book that was in the possession of one Jürgen Leitner for some time within which violent mutilations are described. However, the contents are honestly probably closer to the flesh or the slaughter, but I have to talk about something, so there it is. Good enough. The hunt has no pre-changed locations, given that most of its avatars prefer to move around so that they can hunt prey. I suppose we could talk about the homes of the vampires or the area in Blue Ridge, Virginia where the werewolf showed up, but both of those feel flimsy at best, so I'll just move on. The hunt's ritual is really strange compared to most of the others, and we also know very little about how it works. Known as the Everchase, this ritual is one of the few rituals for which we have no record of a modern iteration, and maybe for good reason. Originally, it took the form of an unending chase after the city of Z, or Z, I suppose. But wait, hold on a minute, how does a ritual work if it never ends? As far as we can tell, it doesn't. The whole point of the Everchase is that the hunt would never allow its ritual to end, which may indicate that the reason the hunt hasn't tried another attempt at the Everchase is because, somewhere deep in the Amazon rainforest, its first attempt is still going, forever seeking a treasure that doesn't exist. After the change, the hunt gets a few different domains, each of which reflect its unique role as a dread power. The forest is the first hunt domain in which a band of roving murderers repeatedly suss out the weakest in their pack in order to chase and mercilessly slaughter them. If you remember back to the characters, I mentioned the Admiral, and that's because of his role in the Cat Domain, which is basically where there are big cats harassing prey. The final domain is one that's a bit harder to explain, but I'll give it my best shot. According to John, it's entirely possible that Basira's hunt for Daisy was itself a type of mini-domain with one occupant, which is why, following Daisy's death, Basira was able to roam the other fearscapes as a questing hunter. Honestly, it's never made 100% clear if that's what's going on, but it works thematically and gives me one more to talk about, so here we are. 
The hunt has connections to all of the entities, given that hunters are often hired as hitmen for the fears, but I'll try to be more specific. Daisy and Basira obviously spend a fair deal of time working for the Magnus Institute, and thus the Eye, which makes sense given the similarities between the paranoia of being watched brought on by the Eye, and the feeling of being stalked expressed by the Hunt. The Stranger also has certain similarities, given the roles which hunters tend to fall into, as best seen in the instances where hunt avatars turn on each other and change from predator to prey. Finally, the hunt has a good amount of overlap with the slaughter, to the point where Johnny has gone on record to say that the hunt and the slaughter were one in the same pretty far into development. It seems that slaughter avatars may actually be just as dangerous as hunt avatars to other beings of the fears, though slaughter avatars seem to explode in rage rather than meticulously pursuing their prey. Alright, time for the part of the video that takes this from being a thinly veiled plot summary into something actually worthwhile. The analysis. The hunt, as I see it, is probably the entity which best represents the second season of the Magnus Archives. First off, obviously the primary hunters we see throughout the series are established in this season as a part of the Prentice Aftermath, but perhaps more importantly is how it impacts John. Jonathan Sims goes way off the deep end for this season, and his obsession with tracking down Gertrude's killer paired with his paranoia could be seen as a symbol of the eye's control over him, or it could be seen as hunter-like obsession. The hunt is the fear of an enemy lurking in the shadows, waiting for a perfect moment to pounce, and John is both terribly afraid that these are his employees' intentions while himself fulfilling this role for other characters, almost all of whom suspect him as the culprit. The internal paranoia and knowledge that one among the pack is the new prey is the hunt through and through, so there we are. The hunt actually fits into my ongoing story metaphor pretty well, as I believe that it represents the character motivations within the story. Much like the animalistic drive of the hunt, characters are propelled forward by their wants and needs through the plot, always driving them towards an ending. The hunt elects to never end because its entire purpose is the drive, something that's unnecessary once the desires that motivated the journey are acquired. Motivation is the entire reason for the plot's existence, and without it a story falls apart. Now on to the more in-story analysis. The hunt is a very interesting entity because of how laser focused it is on avatars, which makes sense for what it represents. The hunt is strongly interpersonal, and those connections can't shine through in an artifact or location the same way they can for an avatar. Speaking of those interpersonal connections, I find the way that the hunt handles unity to be very interesting. Time and again we see packs of hunters appear, and it seems that hunters prefer not to work alone, so it would make sense that some degree of camaraderie would form there. However, there's also this recurring theme of weeding out the weak and killing members of one's own group, which almost indicates the opposite. The hunt seems fickle, yet the ties that bind its avatars always seem to be very strong, like family or friendships, which point me in the direction of something more going on here. It was Mag 112, Thrill of the Chase, that really let me figure out what's going on, because Murder Club is the perfect example. I think the hunt is about greed and selfishness at its core, but that it also knows it requires help to get far enough along the path to where that can become a concern. Thus, I think that the hunt intentionally either chooses those with close connections, or makes those it chooses form close connections, as a method of expanding, but once the goal is in sight, it forces them away from each other. I'm still not sure how I feel about this, but it explains a lot of the interactions we see between hunt avatars, so I don't know, I guess I'll leave it there. This marks the end of the hunt. We're making our way through this list pretty quickly, if I do say so myself. I feel like there are a couple of things I should probably address while I'm here. This video was originally going to be a spiral video, but I ended up changing its trajectory halfway through production since I liked the hunt in this spot better for thematic purposes. Plus, if I was going to find a creative way to swap out any entity, the spiral would be the easiest and most on brand. Also, if I sound off, it's because I might be sick again. I have no idea how I'm getting sick this often, but here we are. Anyways, was there anything I missed? 
I comb through a lot of stuff for these episodes, but I still wind up missing stuff, so if you spot anything, be sure to let me know in the comments, where you'll be credited in the inevitable loose ends and missed bits video at the end of this series. Don't forget to subscribe if you are new, and catch us back here for the next installation, where I'll be going over the crawling rot. In the meantime, thank you for watching, I've been Afton Geek here, and this has been Entities Explained. Good night, YouTube people.